Star coming on the air with a lot of moving pieces here, including President Biden cutting short his overseas trip, planning to try to cut a deal to raise the debt ceiling, with time running out to prevent widespread suffering. Don't take our word for it. That's what the Treasury Secretary says will happen if there's no deal. The House Speaker just in the last few minutes walking out of the White House, and the vibe check is like may be hopeful, we'll explain. Also tonight, new details on a shooting in New Mexico after an 18-year-old apparently killed three women, all older than 70. We are just learning their names. Why police say this attack was, in their words, purely random. Plus, a wild story out of Chicago. A missing child found after six years, after somebody apparently spotted her in a store 600-plus miles away. How a Netflix show may have helped. And in the backstory, an exclusive behind the scenes look at our team's interview, our colleagues' interview with the head of Microsoft, all about the race to come out ahead on AI. Then, who pays the bills in your relationship? Who should pay? Why one celebrity couple's open conversation about money is lighting up everybody online. We'll get into it later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're just now learning that President Biden is cutting short his planned trip to Asia so he can be back here in Washington to try to stop a global economic meltdown. As we've seen just in the last little bit here, this very high-stakes meeting with top members of Congress, top leaders, just wrapping up. And the vibes, it seems, are actually kind of promising right now. You're seeing the meeting here, right? The president, the so-called big four negotiators here. But importantly, this guy, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, the main person the president has to talk with to get a deal done. If they can't, we're talking the possibility of a stock market crash, maybe millions of people losing their jobs. We don't really know because it's never happened before. But the glimmer of good news, the president says he'll check in with lawmakers by phone later this week since he's going to Japan for the G7, that he thinks there's a path for a responsible bipartisan budget agreement. And while Speaker McCarthy's clear these two sides are still fall far apart, everybody seems to agree that things are at least moving in the right direction. Listen. The president agreed to um, appoint a couple people from his administration to sit down and negotiate directly with uh, my team, so I found that to be productive. There were honest and real discussions about differences that we have on a whole variety of issues, but it was all respectful. And they are up against the clock here, right? We know the date when the Treasury Secretary thinks we'll run out of money as early as June 1st, and she says there's no time to waste. The U.S. economy hangs in the balance. The livelihood livelihoods of millions of Americans do, too. Ali Rafa is joining us now live outside the White House. So, Ali, the whole point of this, right, is, is the U.S. going to be able to pay its bills when they come due in just about two weeks? We don't know the answer yet. Are we getting closer to an answer? Yeah, Hallie. Well, we're still waiting to see if President Biden talks about what he's thought of this meeting that lasted about an hour when he talks at this event in the next uh, hour now. Uh, but really, what we heard from these leaders coming out of this meeting is certainly not what the White House wanted to hear today, especially the day before the president is slated to leave on what was supposed to be this historic overseas trip going to three countries. Now that's been cut short. Two of those countries uh, not in the works anymore. Uh, and Speaker McCarthy was the one that dropped really the biggest headline uh, that came out of this meeting, saying the only thing to come out of it was the president shrinking the crowd of people involved in these talks. The two uh, coming to an agreement uh, that the counselor to the president, Steve Reschetti, and OMB director Shalanda Young will be the ones to lead uh, these efforts. And that comes after there's been complaints in some cases from both sides of the aisle that there were essentially too many cooks in the kitchen here and not enough progress was being done in this really short time frame. Uh, as far as what progress was made, uh, Speaker McCarthy said uh, that there are still many differences, but that he still thinks that a deal can be done in the next week. That is incredibly ambitious of Speaker McCarthy to say, considering not only the fact that President Biden will be on this overseas trip, even though White House officials say he'll be plugged in, uh, but just the fact of where the timeline goes and that once it hits the House and the Senate, it's going to take a week for the Senate alone to reach uh, a, right. an agreement agreement here. So I think the big looming question here is how much, if at all, does this time crunch uh, affect the concessions or how uh, how this needle moves in either direction? Right. And the timing, right? You've got McCarthy saying a deal is possible by the weekend. He's sort of saying to Republicans, unsurprisingly, you got to stick together. You've talked about some of the issues at play here. We know President Biden, as we mentioned, and as you well know, right, had this huge trip planned. He's only going to do like half of it. 
come back home to be able to sort of finish up any negotiations here. Walk us through what that looks like, right? Walk us through how this is going to go down. So there are a couple areas of common ground that we're hearing of. That's permitting reform, essentially streamlining the ability to get energy permits for some energy projects and clawing back of unspent COVID funds. Uh, what there is disagreement over, which McCarthy says is a red line for him and is demanding it, are these work requirements for some federal assistance program, essentially making it harder for some people to reach those requirements to be able to receive that federal aid. President Biden uh, seemed to suggest this past weekend that he'd be open to those work requirements for certain federal programs besides Medicaid. That ignited a firestorm among progressives who were uh, staunchly against that. But at this point, the White House is not saying clearly whether or not that is still in the work. So that's something we're going to be keeping an eye out for if that is still involved in these talks as they progress. Ali Rafa, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We've got some breaking news to get to uh, with the Secret Service here in Washington investigating how somebody apparently broke into the house of the national security advisor in this country, Jake Sullivan. A spokesperson for the Secret Service says even though Sullivan wasn't hurt, they're taking this seriously. They're reviewing their procedures, telling us if any of these protocols were not followed, then people will be held accountable. Monica Alba joins us now. This is a bananas story, right? Because apparently this happened a few weeks ago. We're just now learning about it, that Jake Sullivan, again, the national security advisor at the White House, had somebody just in his house, right? I mean, th this feels strange, Mon. Walk us through the details. Strange and scary for anyone, yeah. right, Hallie? And there's still a lot we don't know about this encounter, but what is significant is the fact that the Secret Service is investigating, reviewing how this happened, because the National Security Advisor is somebody who has Secret Service protection round the clock. So not just when they're doing important government work or going on foreign trips or when they're near the president, but also when they're at home or when they're doing anything else in their personal life because of their public profile. So we are learning from the Secret Service statement here that this did occur in the middle of the night a couple of weeks ago. It appears in the encounter, and we do know a couple more details from the Washington Post, that reported that essentially this man got into the home. It's unclear how he got into the home. And then he left before National Security Advisor Sullivan could get outside to let the Secret Service agents know that somebody had been in his home. So they weren't able to detain this person and question him, which normally, if this were to happen in another case where that would be the scenario, they would likely then arrest or charge somebody potentially with trespassing. That's not what occurred in this situation. So that's why they're going to try to continue to review, see if there's any other information pertinent to the scenario that they can kind of piece together why this happened, where the entry occurred, and any other relevant details. But the important thing, Hallie, here too, is this atmosphere of some just more scary incidents and some kind of that venture into violence, as we saw, of yeah. course, with the speaker, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, and then just in the last 24 hours with his district in Virginia with a man entering there. Of course, there's still a lot we have to learn about the Jake Sullivan incident, but something that clearly raised some concern with the Secret yeah. Service. That is for sure, understandably. Monica Alba, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Out West, we're just getting some brand new details in about that chaotic shooting in New Mexico where an attacker killed at least three people. In just the last couple of minutes, we've heard from police sharing more about who these victims were. Listen. Shirley Voita, Melody Ivy, and Gwendolyn Schofield. Shirley, Melody, and Gwendolyn were valued members of our community, and their untimely deaths have left a void that can never be filled. Here is what we know about this shooting in New Mexico, that at least three people were hurt. I mean, killed, of course, as you just heard, six people injured. The suspect was killed on the scene. The shooter seemed to fire at random. This person had three different weapons, but there's still no word on motive. I want to bring in Rahima Ellis, who is covering this story for us. Um, and again, I want, to, I want to zero in on something that we showed there, Rahima, random, right? Purely random in the words of police. Help us understand that. What else do they know and what comes next? Well, they know that this happened over about of a quarter of a mile area, large area, the officer said, that they were working with and investigating this. They also know now, have identified who the shooter was, and that he was not someone who they said was on their radar. Radar. He had some minor infractions as a juvenile, but nothing that would rise to the level of this. Take a listen. So the suspect has been identified as Boo 
I'm sorry, Bo Wilson. He is uh, a student of Farmington High School. He was armed with multiple firearms, including an AR-style rifle. We believe that um, a family member was the legal owner of those firearms. But the officers also said that this teenage suspect also had legally purchased a firearm right after his 18th birthday in October. He purchased this firearm in November. They talked about having three weapons, including one. He said it was like an AR-style rifle. He didn't say it was an AR-15, but he said it was like that style. And he also pointed out about the fact that while there were people who were injured in their cars and they were shooting at houses and cars. No one was injured in their homes. Uh, something more about the victims, he told us, in terms of the three women who were killed, two who were 70, and one woman was in her 90s, he said. One of the women also had five children, and their families, as we can probably just imagine, their families are um, really mourning tonight. There was a question asked of the police, and that is whether or not uh, the family owned these weapons that the suspect had uh, possession of, and if they were aware of that, the officer says it is part of their continuing investigation, and that there were, I think I mentioned that there were more than 150 shells that they found in the crime scene area. They can't say how many of those shells were fired by the teenage suspect or how many were fired by police and authorities. But that's part of the investigation that they're trying to sort through right now. Hallie? It is the horrific reality in this country, Rahema, that after attacks like these, shootings like these, there is a sort of awful rhythm, right? The, the revelation of what happened, the details about the lives lost here, anything we might learn about motive, and then this piece that comes up of, will anything change, right? Could any laws change here? We know the answer to that, at least so far in the federal level. What about the state level? Is there any appetite for that there? Well, it's one of the things that they're talking about. In fact, I want to share with you something coming from members of the New Mexico delegation. And they said today, today is a painful reminder that we must do more. We are committed to fighting for sensible gun safety measures that will keep New Mexicans safe. The question becomes one of what will that translate into in terms of gun safety legislation? The answer to that is not clear at this moment. Hallie? Rahema Ellis, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So listen, the CEO of OpenAI, you know, the company that makes that chat GPT chatbot, basically begging Congress today to regulate his own company, companies like his, the whole AI thing, ASAP, before the tech gets ahead of itself. You have this guy laying out a three-point plan for how the government should actually do this, right? Put some rules in place. Create this new government agency to license models. Put a set of safety standards in place. Make sure that there are independent audits of this kind of stuff. Comparing it, in some ways, to the printing press. Right? Congress is trying to figure out, like, what is AI? What can it do? They're trying to get ahead of any possible risks with more and more companies exploding into this space. Interestingly... It also played a part at today's hearing. Listen to how one senator kicked off this whole thing today in Congress. Listen. The lack of transparency can undermine public trust. If you were listening from home, you might have thought that voice was mine and the words from me. But in fact, that voice was not mine. Tom Casello is joining us now. That was Senator Richard Blumenthal basically yep. using... AI and deep fakes to simulate his own voice yeah. speaking in a hearing. I mean, a demonstration of this powerful technology and what it can do. Um, those concerns were raised today. What could it mean for, for election interference, yeah. for example? Talk us through this. Uh, well, this is uh, magnifying by the hour. That is how fast AI is developing and growing. And you're absolutely right. The concern is, of course, that because you couldn't tell the difference with Senator Blumenthal, the real one versus the fake one, by the way, completely created by ChatGPT, uh, the whole point being, how will you and I determine what's real and what's fake when it comes to news, when it comes to determining whether a candidate is real or fake, when it comes to actually deciding whether medical advice is real or legit? The concern is that this is developing so quickly that it is quickly going to undermine confidence in governments, in news, as if it's not already, uh, also in our very society going forward. And so the bottom line is that they are trying to get a handle on it. And even the CEO of this company says, regulate us. 
please regulate AI before it's getting, it gets out of control, and they're warning it's going to get out of control. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. Significant harm That's to the scary. world. By the way, That's I like talked to the scary thing. I talked to the godfather of AI last week, the guy from Google who left yeah. because he's worried about AI potentially taking over humanity. He gives us five years. Five years until computers are smarter than we are. I don't think we've wrapped our heads around what this means yet. And the thing that is is sticking in my sort of mind on this yeah. is okay, so he wants regulations on the on the sort of industry writ large. Boy, have we been talking about regulations on tech companies for years yeah. related to social media companies, related to other Which has companies. failed. And, and Congress hasn't been able to do it. So right. what now? Like, what would the next step be? We mentioned that printing press comment yeah. from Senator Josh Hawley saying, like, maybe this is kind of the new printing press. Okay, so, like, what's Congress actually going to do? Uh, so Hawley said this could be a printing press moment that revolutionizes the world, or it could be the atom bomb moment that we regret forever, and there's no taking it back. What's interesting, having watched this hearing, and then last week we had a White House summit on this as well, there is bipartisan agreement now that they need to come up with some firewalls, so they say. Okay, but what, Tom? Because there's rails. bipartisan agreement on protecting kids on social... Like, there's there's different bipartisan agreement, and yet tangibly, yeah. not much has moved Here's the what they want to do, say they say right now, and by the way, even Senator Graham today was on board with this, create an office that is similar to the, um, the nuclear energy uh, office, which mm -hmm. regulates nuclear energy, or the FDA that regulates meds, or the FAA that regulates air traffic. You've got to do something to get a hold of this before it's absolutely too late. And it is growing so fast. Look at the chat GPT monthly visits. We had 266 million of them just in December. Look at it now. 1.76 billion in April 23. Wow. That is not just kids writing their term papers. Or senators making deep fakes of their voices, exactly. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's or Hallie Jackson on News Now. It is not We've that. Done it. I mean, we did, we did a politicians kicking puppies type, but, you know, images. Yeah. It's crazy the things that you can kind of come up with here. Tom Casella, fascinating. You bet. You. Scary times. To North Carolina now, where Republicans in that state think they have the votes that would overturn a veto by the state's Democratic governor to put in place an abortion ban that could very much restrict access to those reproductive health issues in, in that state. Uh, we, we're going to show you a live look at the state Senate. Looks like that camera just went down, but in Raleigh, there is a vote that is planning to happen tonight. And the woman you see here could be key, Trisha Cotham, a Republican who switched parties after winning her seat as an abortion rights-backing Democrat just in the last couple of months. Just one vote in either chamber would stop this bill. This is what it comes down to, folks. It is down to one vote here. And right now, Republicans feel confident that one vote is not going to defect from them. You see what's at stake here. 12 weeks is the current law. The current law is a ban after 20 weeks. What's on the table is 12 weeks or 20 weeks for rape or incest exceptions. There are 24 weeks for what they describe as life-limiting fetal anomalies. The only exception in place is that if there is any threat to the mother's life. Yamiche Alcindor is following this from Washington. Okay, Yamiche, that's a mouthful there, right? But this has been building and building and building in North Carolina for a while. The governor has basically been trying to lobby for just one vote for a while now so that this veto would not happen, right? It would not, his decision would not get overturned. Where does this go? Well, Republicans, who, as you said, have a thin but super majority in the North Carolina legislature, they're expected to override the veto of the Democratic governor, Roy Cooper. And as you mentioned, um, the state Senate there is now in debate over that vote, over that veto. So they're meeting right now, Hallie. But the GOP's push to further restrict abortion access is not in line with public opinion in the state, according to polling that we've been looking at. Let's put up some numbers for folks. From a Meredith College poll, 31 percent of North Carolina voters want the state to keep its current 20-week abortion ban. Another 26 percent, well, they want abortion access to be even further expanded. That means even more access to abortion. And then you have a much smaller number who want a further restrictions, who want further restrictions, including just 9 percent of North Carolina voters who want access to be under 15 weeks of pregnancy, which is what this new bill would do. And we have to remind folks, not only is this bill going to be making it going to be going to 12 weeks of pregnancy to ban abortion, you're also going to have in-person visits 72 hours before a surgical abortion. You're also going to have doctors needing to be present for medication abortions. So there's a lot of other things in this bill, along with the 12-week abortion ban. Let me put up a map here, because I think there is an illustration of why this matters to people, not just in North Carolina, but outside that state's borders as well. You can see 
how bans on abortion have been put in place across the South. Right now, there is South Carolina that remains the only state now without a so-called pre-viability ban. That's only because the state's court has intervened, at least at this point. Um, They're literally voting on a six-week ban today. If North Carolina does put this ban in place, there would be a repercussion for millions of women in the region, not just in the state, right? That's right, Hallie. And that map that you put up is so important because these new restrictions in North Carolina, well, they would have sweeping effects for women across the South. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last June, North Carolina and South Carolina, by the way, have become top abortion destinations for people from states where it is banned or severely restricted. It's clear in the numbers. North Carolina had 37 percent jump in abortions being performed that year. South Carolina, there are about 1,000 more abortions performed, nearly half of the patients from out of state. So definitely a, a long and hard place to look there. And also, if you look at it, um, there are people that are driving up to four hours from places like Tennessee to get access and waiting more than a month. So a, a big change there and a big impact, Hallie. Yamish Alcindor, thank you very much. Relief tonight in Chicago for a father whose daughter has been found after six years. Kayla and Bihan was just nine years old when she was allegedly kidnapped by her mother, who did not have legal custody of her. Her father reported her missing. Police have been looking for her ever since. Kayla is 15 now, found just this week in Asheville, North Carolina, when somebody in a store recognized her mom from a media report and called police, according to law enforcement. This is a case that got national attention last year when it was featured on a Netflix show called Unsolved Mysteries. Maggie Vespa joins us now. This case had basically gone cold until somebody recognized right. Kayla's mother from what they describe as media reports. We don't know, right, that it's the Netflix show, although we know that Netflix show featured this case. Talk about sort of the... the incredible reaction here from her family and where this goes. I mean, incredible is the perfect word, right? We're talking about six years later, and we know, and there are a number of statistics out there, and actually an expert that we just spoke to from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children didn't want to nail any one in particular down because they said every case is different. And this is kind of a perfect example. This girl's been missing for six years, right? Her mother, uh, police said, took her after a judge gave the father custody, and basically he went to pick up his daughter at mom's house, and both were gone. And that was six years ago. Police have been zeroing in on the East Coast, knowing that she had family in the Southeast, but at this point, um, officials with that national center say they don't know what the connection is to Asheville, North Carolina. We'll enter these national media reports. They're calling it published media in Asheville. But of course, that Netflix show, Unsolved Mysteries, is a possibility. There's also a, a series called Vanish that right now is available on Peacock. That also featured this case. And now we have someone recognizing the mother. And suddenly tonight, Kayla is home. And the family overjoyed. The father Ryan, Kayla's dad, releasing a statement saying in part that he is, again, uh, his words overjoyed, that Kayla is home safe. He wrote, we ask for privacy as we get to know each other again and navigate this new beginning. He just saw his daughter last when she was nine. She's now 15. And of course, she's been through an incredible ordeal. Also, her mother, again, now charged in this basically custodial kidnapping, she faces one count of child abduction. She's being held right now on a quarter million dollars bond. There she is, Heather Unbehan. And again, more charges are possible. We're awaiting her extradition from North Carolina back to Illinois to face that charge. But this girl's world, Hallie, as you know, has been turned yeah. upside down, to say the least. And now this family is just going to try to put the pieces back together. But everybody just thrilled and amazed that it came together after this many years and kind of in that way. Just seems so against the odds, Hallie. It's crazy. And part of the reason for it, Maggie, seems to be some of the publicity around this case, right? It was featured, it was publicized right. by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is obviously, as you as you talked about, out with reaction today. There is a Facebook page dedicated to bringing her home that we mentioned the Netflix series here. That seems to have played a part in publicizing at least the images of these people, um, of Kayla's mom, for example, which is it's, how this It's happened. played a huge part. And Definitely. It's played a huge part. And really in this modern world, those true crime shows that we're talking about, that you're talking about, that's kind of a new tool that these um, advocates are using, like Unsolved Mysteries and um, the John Walsh show that's aired on a number of different platforms on CNN as well. And then, of course, the one on Peacock that I mentioned, because those series, they don't just reach broad audiences, but they keep reaching audiences. People keep finding them, right? If they're available on streaming platforms, new eyes stumble upon them every day. And that's how you have something like Unsolved Mysteries that came out last fall. Suddenly someone sees it. Potentially, again, that could be the link here, police say. And now we have a case that has indeed been solved, Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thank you. The CDC tonight putting out a new warning that the MPOX outbreak is not over. 
It's looking into a new cluster of cases in Chicago, raising some concerns ahead of the summer. So here's the deal. Between April 17th and May 5th, Chicago reported 13 cases. All were in men who had symptoms. They were not hospitalized. Nine of those 13, interestingly, had been fully vaccinated against MPOX. The CDC says this spring, the rest of it, and the summer could mean a resurgence maybe of MPOX with people getting together for festivals and other events. Remember, this spreads by person-to-person -person contact. It mainly affects gay and bisexual men. For a while, it seemed like the spread was slowing down, right? Literally just last week, the World Health Organization said it was no longer a global health emergency. This country's public health emergency over it expired at the end of January. I want to bring in Dr. Natalie Azar. Um, Dr. Natalie, let me pull up this sort of cluster of cases in Chicago, a graph of this over the last few weeks, right? Sure, but look at the peak last summer. Way, way, way more, right? Context is key here. So help us understand the level of concern for public health experts given where we are now. Yeah, well, I think it's it's an, it's interesting, right, that less than a week since the World Health Organization said it no longer designated MPOX as a global health threat, that it could still remain a public health challenge. And I think what's important to understand here, again, as you said, context, of course, is that only one out of four high-risk individuals act actually has been vaccinated. And, and, and we don't know how long protection lasts. This, this, the use of this smallpox vaccine for MPOX was actually a novel intervention. Um, you know, I think it's important for people to understand, again, that the vast majority of people who are going to get infected with MPOX are going to be just fine, but there are going to be vulnerable individuals who can get sicker. I think there's a few things to take from this from this new cluster. As you mentioned, nine of the individuals were fully yeah. vaccinated. As I mentioned, we don't know how long protection lasts. None of the individuals was hospitalized. We don't know their underlying health history, but that's obviously encouraging because experts do believe that the um, that the vaccine, even if it doesn't protect you against infection, will prevent you from severe disease, much like COVID vaccines. Dr. Natalie Azar, um, that is, it is interesting to watch. We'll keep an eye on it. Thank you very much for the breakdown. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, just nine months after a stabbing that left him blind in one eye, author Salman Rushdie is out with a pretty serious warning in a rare public speech. And the feds charging a former Apple employee after they say he passed on some big secrets to China. That's later on in The Five Things. A new study is putting the focus back on a decades-old antibiotic, how it could be key in the fight against a deadly disease later on in The Five Things. But first, tonight, a rare public comment from author Salman Rushdie, who was, you remember, attacked and badly hurt on stage nine months ago, now warning about what he calls remarkably alarming censorship threats to publishing, to libraries, and to kids' books in this country. Listen. We live in a moment... I think, uh, at which freedom of expression, freedom to publish, has not in my lifetime been under such threat in the, in the countries of the West. So you saw Rusty, of course, making those comments on like a, a video Zoom type thing when he was honored by the British Book Awards. He was blinded in his right eye, had nerve damage to his hand when he was attacked at a literary, literary festival in New York back in August of last year. Ron Allen is joining us now. So you have um, Salman Rushdie, who's been like, physically attacked for his own writing, talking about the freedom to publish at a time when there has been a broader discussion in this country about what should and shouldn't be published and taught, right? Exactly. He says that, you know, this has always been the case in places like Russia and China, the, the communist world. Uh, but he notes that here in the United States, there are a lot of discussions, a lot of fights, if you will, about what books can be in libraries and schools. A lot of it has to do with history. A lot of it has to do with race. A lot of it has to do with gender identity. There's an organization called PEN America, PEN America, that says that there are now more books being banned more, in more school districts, in more states, uh, as many as 35 states, and that this is an, an alarming thing, and it continues. And here's what Rusty had to say about that issue generally. Take a listen. And the freedom to publish books that ought to be published, um, that need to be published, and sometimes uh, are difficult to publish because of pressure from this or that group. Um, it's very important, I think, that such pressure should be resisted. 
There's another thing that Pen America said is that it's not just parents who are trying to have books banned. There are now more advocacy groups involved in this, and many of those groups are connected to state le lawmakers in different places who are trying to get bans in bans in an organized way. Um, so that's different, and this is yes something that's uh, being fought all over the country, particularly in certain states. There, there, I also wonder what Rushdie's thoughts are on this issue, and we've covered it a lot on this show, like the idea, and it comes up every few months, editing books by somebody, we've talked about it, Agatha Christie, Roald Dahl, right, to remove language that is now seen as offensive. At the time was, you know, the, the argument goes, critics would say, like, at the time it was put very different now, right? He talked about this, too. He does, and he, here's what he basically says. He says that books have to come to us from their time and be of their time. And a lot of people would disagree with that notion because they want books to be relevant to the times that we live in. There's a whole industry of people called sensitivity readers these days in, in the publishing world. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're rereading books and making huge edits in, in books. Um, Ian Fleming, for example, wrote the Bond, James Bond series. But think about the fact that he was born in 1908 and died in 1964, and the books were written in the 1950s. So a lot has changed since then. And so there are references, for example, to African criminals who are drunken all the time, and that's been removed. There's reference to a couple in Harlem having a conversation, and he describes their accent as straight Harlem, deep south, with lots of New York thrown in, which some people People find, well, people's uh, Harlem is a little bit more complicated than, than that. Um, in Dahl's books, these children's books, there are even references to mother and father that have been changed to parents and family because of sensitivities. So, again, this is going to vary book by book, uh, region of the country by region of the country. Some of it may go too far for some people. Some people like to read books in their time of their time, with the language of their time, and the stereotypes, and all, so on and so forth. Some don't. And I guess, as I said, this is something that's being fought, debated all yeah. across the country. Yeah, for sure, writ large. Ron Allen, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the CIA is trying to get Russians to talk to them by posting this video online, offering people in Russia a secure way to communicate with the agency. CIA saying it would protect their safety if they share secrets about the war in Ukraine or other information with U.S. spies. Spokespeople for the Russian government says they're monitoring this space. They called it a convenient resource for tracking potential leaks. Number two, the Justice Department saying it's charged a former Apple engineer for allegedly stealing the company's self-driving technology for a Chinese company. According to this indictment, the man worked at Apple for two years where he was given broad access, they say, to databases. He's the third Apple worker to be accused of stealing autonomous trade secrets for China. Apple declined to comment. Number three, shares of Vodafone took a hit today after the British telecom company announced plans to lay off 11,000 people. It'll reportedly be the biggest round of layoffs ever for that company, set to happen over the next three years. The CEO says the cuts will focus on cutting out complexity to get competitiveness. Number four, new research suggests a really old antibiotic could work against drug-resistant bacterial infections. Called, it's called orsothricin, orsothricin. It was discovered back in the 40s, but dropped from development because it was toxic for people's kidneys. But now, scientists say they found way less toxic versions that are still effective, something they're exploring. Number five, the world's earliest, mostly complete copy of the Hebrew Bible is up for sale at Sotheby's. Could sell for like 30 to $50 million. Officials say it's believed to have been created in the late 9th or early 10th century. The codex contains all 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. It's only missing 12 pages. Incredible. Still to come, elections with huge implications in May. Do we have the timeline right? We sure do. We'll tell you what we're watching for tonight as voters are voting and what it all means next. We are learning more about the suspect in that violent baseball bat attack at a Virginia congressional office. More on that later in the local. But first, it is election day in some spots around the country. But these races aren't just local, right? They, otherwise, why would we talk about them on the national news? The reason is because they could give us some insight into what could happen next year, come 2024. Let's start down in Kentucky, where it's a battle of dueling endorsements as Republicans are voting on who they want to take on the Democratic governor of that state, Andy Bashir, this fall. Former President Trump is endorsing one leading candidate. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is endorsing the other. You picking up the proxy fight vibes? 
DeSantis is expected to announce his run in the 2024 race any day now. In his home state, a close mayoral runoff in Jacksonville could answer a couple of questions. How strong is a DeSantis endorsement? And can Democrats win a key race in a state that's been leaning more Republican? I want to bring in Chuck Brewster, who is live for us in Jacksonville. Um, this runoff has a lot of money and some star power, right? The Democrat... I hate to say, like, star power for a news anchor, but at least a familiar face for people. The Republican is a big player in Jacksonville, and there's, there's a lot of money that's getting spent here. That's right, Allie. News anchor, and she was a big uh, con contributor. She has her own marathon here, her, whole, her own race, and she also uh, is pretty well known in the community. So there is some star power there. That's a legitimate phrase to use here. But, you know, yes, there was a lot of money spent on this. Polls coming into today showed this race extremely close. And when you talk to the voters locally, yes, they're focused on things like crime, housing, infrastructure. But if you take a step back, the big question here is whether or not Democrats still have the juice in Florida. Can they still win in a state that has become increasingly conservative. In a place like Jacksonville, Duval County, this is a county that was an old Republican stronghold, but Democrats were able to win in 2018. President Biden won in 2020, and then came Governor DeSantis and his reelection effort, and he won this county easily. I talked to both party chairs, Democratic chair and Republican chair, about how they're viewing this county now. Listen here. The governor's race was definitely a lack of enthusiasm that really kind of uh, resulted in his ability to not only win this county but in the state. Um, but it wasn't an indication that we have suddenly shifted red in two years. In a microcosm, it epitomizes the great struggle between the right and the left that's been involving our nation for years now. One other thing, they both said that this is a battleground county, and they both said that tonight's result will be close. So we'll definitely be watching to see who ultimately wins this tight contest. It's so funny to be like, okay, here we are talking with Shaq out on the campaign trail in May of 2023. Like, my head I is know. hurting because we're going to be doing this for 18 months. But it's interesting because of what we described, what I described as like the proxy fight vibes here. And that is a big deal, right? These candidates running for president endorsing. Um, how much right. that matters, who endorses them to, we, we look at New Hampshire, several people up there who endorse Mr. Trump are also, or flipping to endorse uh, Governor DeSantis. Um, help us think about this big picture as it relates to next year, right? What we can read from these local races into the big national one that we're all sort of looking towards in 18 months. Yeah, Hallie, because this is another test of if endorsements matter and if they yeah. do, what kind of power do they carry? And Governor DeSantis, he endorsed the Republican candidate in this race, Daniel Davis. It was a statement. He didn't go, come here and campaign with him. But if you look at television ads, you see Governor De DeSantis and Dan Davis together. You see the statement. First thing on his website, you see the quote from Governor DeSantis. So the Republicans surely thinks it's a big factor. The Republican Party chair said, yeah, uh, Governor DeSantis's endorsement played a major role in this race. But when you talk to the Democratic chair, they say, ah, it's not really a factor at all. And some voters today, voters who voted for the Republican, voters who voted for the Democrat, also said it wasn't top of mind for them. So this will ultimately be a test of the power of those endorsements that, yes, will continue to happen as we get closer to that presidential race, Allie. Shaq Brewster, live for us in Florida. Shaq, thank you. Coming up, we'll take you behind the scenes of a big interview with the tech CEO pouring billions of dollars into AI. Andrew Ross Sorkin joins us for the backstory in just a minute. And later in the local, some video you got to see of a kid getting sort of stormed by a dust devil. The person who got him out of there is saying, stay with us. It is time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we are hearing exclusively from Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella about his concerns over where AI is heading. Listen. What scares you about this? What, I'll call it societal choices do we make Given this new technology, we definitely want the benefits of this technology and we want to mitigate the unintended consequences. That conversation coming from a sit down at the company's campus just outside Seattle with a guy you probably recognize, our own Andrew Ross Sorkin from over at CNBC for a special airing tonight right here on NBC News Now. Remember, Microsoft made some bananas huge 
multi-billion dollar investments into open AI. That's the company that created ChatGPT, which is now becoming one of the fastest growing apps ever. Nadella tells Andrew that AI is moving fast, and he thinks that's a good thing. Fast in the right direction. Uh, moving fast where humans are more in control. We are lucky to have Andrew joining us now. Andrew, thank you very much for being here. Thank you know you this segment, me. right? The behind I the scenes well. look. And I'm like, very excited. Okay. Well, our viewers know you, and they know that you talk to like big name people in the business world all the time, right? But this is like, especially with how fast AI moves, especially with how big, like high profile this is. Did you approach this interview differently than you've approached other interviews? Tell us about your process. Well, I think what we we're trying to do. I mean, first of all, we're trying to get Satya Nadella, who really, I mean, has transformed Microsoft as a result of yes. his partnership with ChatGPT. I mean, they, they went, for, I mean, the other piece of this was, you know, Google, we all search on Google. All of a sudden, Bing, people are talking about Bing in a way they never did before. So I, I was desperate to talk to him. But then in terms of the, the conversation itself, I wanted this conversation not to be a business conversation. I wanted this almost ah. to be a philosophical conversation about the pros and the cons and to try to get as honest a, a perspective as I could about it to talk about. We talked about education and what it's going to do to our kids. And we talked about plagiarism and what that means and the value of content, the media industry that we're in. And I think we really got behind a lot of the issues that sort of are, are festering underneath what is going to be a transformative thing, uh, both in fabulous ways and probably some less fabulous ways, too. I'm super interested to hear you say this because one of the things I wanted to ask you about was whether or not you sort of framed this thinking about like the quote unquote CNBC viewer, right? Which maybe right. is a different no. kind and type of viewer. It sounds like you did not. It sounds no, like no, you no. specifically there, wanted this to be There were broader. lots of questions I had that I knew that, that business viewers of CNBC would want asked. And, and we asked uh, some of those. Uh, by the way, we ran some of that on CNBC. But for this special, what we really wanted to do was sort of uh, capture really the way I think the, the public, the broad public, maybe not interested in business at all, but recognizes that their kids are using it. I've got three kids. We're, you yeah. know, they're playing with this thing. We're all trying to figure out what does it mean? Do we, are we going to keep our jobs? What's going to happen to us? I mean, that was really, I think, what this was about. And I think we got underneath a lot of it. Did anything surprise you? You know a lot about this topic. You know a lot about it. Was there anything that he said that you were like, huh, that is actually shocking to me? You know, I think, well, first of all, he's a very, he's, and maybe this is true of all people in tech, he's very optimistic about the technology, and that's, that's yeah. clear. You know, I would say is it maybe not something that he said, or maybe he referenced, in fact, Bill Gates, who had said that he saw two demos in his whole life that he thought were transformative. One was back in the 80s, he saw um, graphical interfaces. I mean, what effectively became the Mac interface and the Windows interface. And he said it wasn't till last fall when a bunch of folks showed up with ChatGPT in his home to give him a demo. And he said, this was such a profound thing. And wow. I also got a chance to see some of what they're working on at Microsoft. And it's profound. I mean, profound in a sort of scary way, but also in a super exciting way. So um, there's a little bit for everybody. Well, but that's the thing, too, with stuff like this. It can, it can sometimes be a double-edged sword. So we are excited to see the special. We are thrilled to have you on, giving us that peek behind the curtain. Um, thank, thank you, you. so, thank you so much me. for doing this. Andrew, really appreciate it. Appreciate it. And you got to watch, folks. It's tonight uh, right here on NBC News Now. However you're watching, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time with Andrew Ross Sorkin. Do not miss it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our D.C. bureau, the Virginia man accused of attacking two of Congressman Jerry Connolly's staffers with a baseball bat apparently refused to show up in court today. He's facing three felonies, one misdemeanor charge. Police say the congressman was not in his office at the time and that both staffers are expected to be okay. Out of our Western Bureau, Washington Governor Jay Inslee just signed a bill that would ban certain toxic chemicals found in some common beauty products, stuff like lipsticks, powder, hair gels, leave-in conditioners. Companies are going to be fined for each offense, although they have until 2026 to phase out their current supply of these banned chemicals. 
And from our Southern Bureau in Jacksonville, Florida, look at this, an ump, a teenage ump at a kid's baseball game, saved a kid. Look, this dust devil pops up out of nowhere right at home plate. The ump, again, 17, bops in, grab, you know, the catcher's kind of caught up in this vortex, pulls the kid out of the way. He was able to finish the game. He said he'd never seen anything that like that before in his life, on or off the field. Pretty amazing and amazingly quick work by that teenager. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it is all about money. Your money, maybe your partner's money. How do you share it? How do you split it? All of it sparked by some new comments from actor Gabrielle Union. Her husband, former NBA player Dwayne Wade, of course, have a household together. They pay their bills. And now Union, in a new interview she did with Bloomberg, says she and Wade split everything 50-50. That has so many people online talking about this, what it means for them, how they see it in their own families. One expert our team talked with says it's not surprising considering how touchy of a subject money can be for people, especially people in relationships. Listen. <laughs> New money talk from actor Gabrielle Union, revealing she and her husband, former NBA player Dwayne Wade, split their money right down the middle. It's weird to say I'm head of household because in this household, we split everything 50-50. But in the other households that each of us have to support, it puts this, there's always this like gorilla on your back that it is like, you better work. You better, you better work. Union opening up in an interview on a Bloomberg original series called Idea Generation. I get nervous, like, oh God, that, that movie didn't open. You know, well, what does that mean? Do I, am I, do I, do, am I going to have enough to, to, to hold everybody up? And, and, and everyone's like, it's coming. Like, calm down. All of it clearly hitting a nerve online. Union's comments going viral as a lot of people talk about how they handle their money and how couples handle cash. Now, how are you living paycheck to paycheck when your husband got money? 50 50. The back and forth over how to split the bills, nothing new for most couples. For some reason, people just don't want to talk about their money, couples especially. And having that money talk with your partner is one of the most important things that you can do in your financial life and for financial security for both of you. These days, about 29% of marriages are something described as egalitarian, according to a new study, which basically means that both partners contribute about half of what they make. To put that number in perspective, back in 1972... It was just 11%. The generation most likely to have separate accounts? Millennials. 69% of them report having at least some cash in separate places. There may be couples that decide to split 50-50, but there are also couples that may say, hey, we're going to look at our household income, how much we each contributed to that number as it's combined, and then we're going to split our finances based on that. Money can be one of the biggest flashpoints in a relationship, with 64% of couples saying they're financially incompatible with their partners. That's not the case for Alexandra Hayes Robinson and her husband. I think we're very lucky that money has never been a touchy subject for us. So how do they do it? She says they decided long ago to split the bills based on how much money each of them made, the one who makes more pays more, and today they're happier for it. We haven't officially merged our finances in the way that like we have one bank account and everything we both make go into one account, but we've merged our finances in like the like spiritual sense, I guess. We think about everything we have as one pot. There will be a lot of opportunity for us to have lots of kind of financial tension in our relationship, and there just isn't. Experts say being open and transparent about money stuff is sometimes uh, a good key for people in relationships. So to come, after a historic snowfall in California's mountains this winter, locals are bracing for a big melt. We've got to look at new technology helping to prep for what could be a big threat. California's weather whiplash means the threat there has gone from historic drought to the opposite, historic risk of floods, right? So now the state is bracing for what's being called the big melt. There's a ton of snow on mountains all across the state, thanks to those big winter storms. Well, you know what happens now that we're getting close to summer. Obviously, the weather warms up. What happens when the weather warms up? The snow melts into streams and rivers, which means downstream, downriver, you've got major risk of places flooding. Well, now, officials in California are using some new technology to figure out just how much snow is actually in those mountains, flying thousands of feet in a, above them, 
in a plane with specialized devices scanning this whole area to map out the snow to get an idea of what kind of water they're looking at. Steve Patterson is joining us now. Like, for, and it, this is sort of mind-blowing as a honorary temporary former Californian, Steve. Um, yeah. You know, like, all we talked about was how there was no water. Like, in, our, in my personal life, I mean, like, it was just like a huge thing. Yeah. No water, no water, no water. Now the risk is, like, too much water could be coming, and there's all this new tech getting deployed to help officials there figure out how much. Yeah, I mean, because you're talking about more water than this state has ever expected. Like 55 billion tons of snow is up there. 40 million acre feet of water. 85,000 Rose Bowl football stadiums was sold to me. That's the amount of water we're talking in the mountains. That's the image that you're looking at right there. And really, until recently, we haven't really had a sense of how it looks like the 3D image of it, because we've been really relying on rudimentary, you know, uh, statistical information that's already there, like automated sensors that's already up there. It gives you a very basic sense of the numbers. So this is new. I mean, the fact that they are flying on top of this six hours a day, every single day, 23,000 feet, and mapping this, almost like giving you a 3D image of the entirety of the snowmelt, is so important because all of that snow means it's a lot of water, means that, as you said, it will melt, it will come down, means it's very dangerous. It means like local water districts and state water districts and the state itself needs to know exactly what is up there because if there's a certain snow cap that's 80 feet that's melting, they know that, they know exactly which river system that's going to hit, so they know to maybe release water from a reservoir that's there or to prepare people to take shelter or to leave. So that's why this is so important. And the guy I was talking to basically said, our knowledge of the snowmelt is going to go from basically radio to HD television that's based amazing. on the technology that you're looking at right now. So it's super, super important, Hallie. Fascinating stuff. Steve Patterson, thank you yep. so much. Appreciate your reporting you on it. that. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with some moving pieces as it relates to whether the U.S. can pay its bills. You've got the president planning to bust out of his overseas trip early to try to get a deal done to raise the so-called debt ceiling with time running out to prevent widespread suffering. Don't take our word for it. That's what the Treasury Secretary says will happen if there is no deal. But tonight, maybe some hopeful vibes. We'll tell you what we're just hearing from the president in the last 40 minutes. Also tonight, new details on a shooting in New Mexico after an 18-year-old apparently killed three women, all older than 70. We are just learning more about who they were and why police say this attack was, in their words, purely random. Plus, the CEO of a top AI company is here in Washington tonight, asking, almost begging, for more regulations on this new technology. Why he's worried about what he describes as significant harm to the world. And happening right now, North Carolina Republicans could put in place some new restrictions on abortion. The state Senate just overturned the governor's veto. Will they do the same in the House? And what does it mean for millions of women across the South? And why some U.S. spies want some love from Russia, asking folks there to spill secrets on the Kremlin to help this country. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're just now learning that President Biden plans to cut short his trip to Asia so he can be here in Washington to try to stop a global economic meltdown. Wrapping up in just the last maybe two hours or so, this very high-stakes meeting with top leaders in Congress. And the vibe check actually kind of promising right now, right? You see this meeting, you're about to see the meeting here, the president and the so-called big four, right? But most importantly, this guy, the House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, that's the main person the president's got to talk with to get a deal done. If they can't get a deal done, we're talking maybe the stock market crashes, maybe millions of people lose their jobs. We don't really know because this has never happened before. There is a glimmer of good news, right? The president says he's going to check in with lawmakers on the phone later on this week since he's headed to Japan for the G7. And just the last 30, 40 minutes or so, we've heard from him on camera saying that he thinks they are making progress toward avoiding disaster. Listen. I made clear again today's meeting that default is not an option. America pays its debts, pays its bills, and there'll be plenty of time to debate the policy differences. But the country has never, we've never defaulted on our debt, and we never will. Okay, so what does the other side think? Speaker McCarthy's been clear that these two sides are still far apart, but everybody seems to agree that at least the trajectory, at least things seem to be moving in the right direction. 
The president agreed to um, appoint a couple people from his administration to sit down and negotiate directly with uh, my team, so I found that to be productive. There were honest and real discussions about differences that we have on a whole variety of issues, but it was all respectful. Ali Rafa is joining us now live outside the White House. So, Ali, let me take this in a couple of buckets, kind of the politics and then the policy, right? Politics-wise, timeline, um, the Treasury Secretary says this is urgent, that we might run out of money as early as June 1st, right? President Biden heads to Japan tomorrow. We know he's going to come back sooner than expected, but explain to us, like, the next 72-plus hours, what those look like. Yeah, Hallie. Well, I think just the simple fact that two-thirds of the president's what was supposed to be this historic trip uh, have been canceled is all the proof you need that the White House and the president are genuinely concerned about getting this debt uh, deal over the finish line. And as you mentioned, not only getting it over the finish line, but getting it over the finish line without having to make these uh, an incredible amount of concessions and having to bend. Uh, so, as you said, we heard the president talk about and reflect the, about this meeting in the last hour. He says that he made it very clear that default is not on the table. It's not an option. He said the majority of the leaders inside that meeting agreed with him. Uh, but just like we saw after last week's meeting, depend, it depends who you ask how uh, productive these talks were. The president says there was common ground reached, there was progress made. But McCarthy is saying uh, after this meeting that really the, the biggest thing that was accomplished in this meeting was this trimming down of the top negotiators because there have been complaints that there were essentially too many cooks in the kitchen to be able to get any progress done. Uh, so now we know that counselor to the president, uh, Steve Rochetti, OMB Director Shalonda Young, and Director of the, uh, of the uh, Office of Legislative Affairs, Louisa Terrell, will be leading this from the White House's uh, side with uh, coordinating with uh, McCarthy's office. So at this point, the big question is, you know, while the president is away, how much progress is made? How much is the needle moved in either direction? How far do we get to the edge of this debt cliff before either side or one side has to eventually bend? Because it's become very clear at this point, one side or both sides have to. So you've laid out, I think, where, what's at stake? Um, what, are the, what is the biggest sticking point? Like, in other words, if people, because like, let's be real, most people are like, all right, well, wake me up when it's the day before June 1st. Are we going to not pay our bills or what, right? Like, what is the biggest sticking point right now? Yeah, it is pretty confusing, especially when you talk about the terminology of what's uh, really on and off the spending cuts or negotiating table right now. The biggest sticking point uh, that we're hearing from sources familiar with these talks are these work requirements. That's something that Republicans are reportedly uh, pushing for. They want uh, work requirements specifically for the SNAP program, this food assistance program for low-income Americans. Uh, the, uh, Speaker McCarthy saying that that's a red line for him, that it needs to be included in whatever deal is made. And the president this past weekend signaled that he'd be open to that, uh, that the, uh, those work requirements uh, for the SNAP program. And that ignited really a firestorm among progressives uh, who slammed the president for even considering that. The president uh, now saying that he'd be open to those work requirements uh, for federal assistance programs besides Medicaid. But as far as where these talks go, uh, the Speaker McCarthy was asked what specific federal assistance programs he would want want work requirements added to at, during this presser, and he didn't clarify that. But at this point, the White House hasn't been clear whether or not uh, they put a hard line down for any assistance program. So that's something we're going to be watching over the coming days. Ali Rafa, thank you very much. We want to get to some breaking news now. The Secret Service looking into how somebody apparently broke into the house of the National Security Advisor at the White House. A spokesperson for the Secret Service says even though Jake Sullivan was not hurt, they're taking this really seriously. They're looking at their procedures and that if any protocols were not followed, people will be held accountable. Monica Alba is joining us now. The details are kind of bizarre here, Monica, that Jake Sullivan apparently in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. I think it was, sees somebody in his house. He has round the clock protection. Like, help us understand how this adds up. It happened a few weeks ago. What's the sort of level of concern here? 
It is a bizarre story, Hallie, and there's still a lot we don't know about it. The Secret Service is reviewing the incident because exactly at that time a couple of weeks ago, whenever and wherever Jake Sullivan goes because of his public profile as a national security advisor, he does have Secret Service protection. So there would be agents outside his house at nighttime exactly when this would take place. But we are learning from details first reported in the Washington Post that it seems a man was able to get into his home, we don't know how, and then left after a brief encounter with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. And so he wasn't able to be detained by the Secret Service. In fact, it was Mr. Sullivan himself who, when he left, alerted the Secret Service that this incident had just taken place. So it did raise some concern as to how this could happen, why that person was there. There is really no indication yet of any kind of a motive or more information. They're trying to collect more relevant details. But it does come amid this heightened environment for some elected officials and public figures after what happened to former speaker, the former speaker, her husband, Paul Pelosi, in October of last year with an intruder violently attacking him in that home. So there is no indication here that there was anything violent or physical that took place in this brief encounter, but still raising a lot of questions that the Secret Service is now digging into. And this is somebody who has more secret Service protection than some White House officials because of a plot that was actually un uncovered a couple of years ago to potentially assassinate then National Security Advisor John Bolton. So they added more reinforcements to protect wow. any future National Security Advisors, and still something like this took place. Hallie. We ha he's not, when we were showing pictures of him at the podium at the White House press briefings, he will sometimes show up and answer questions, right? Like, especially if there's, like, for example, now a big foreign trip or some big NSA issue. We haven't really, he have we heard from him on this, Mon? Like, I don't think so, but check me on that, because I haven't looked at my phone. Not yet, Hallie, and he has gone on every high-profile foreign trip with the right. president to date, so I expect him mm -hmm. to be on this trip tomorrow, but we'll have to wait and see who's on that final list. Monica Alba, thank you much. Appreciate it. Out West, we're just getting some brand new details into us about that chaotic shooting in New Mexico where somebody killed at least three people. In just the last hour, we've heard from police about who these victims were. Shirley Voita, Melody Ivy, and Gwendolyn Schofield. Shirley, Melody, and Gwendolyn were valued members of our community, and their untimely deaths have left a void that can never be filled. You see the names of the victims right here. Shirley Boyetta, Melody Ivy, Gwendolyn Schofield. Police on scene killed the shooter, a heavily armed 18-year-old, who they say was seemingly firing at people just randomly. They're still trying to figure out why. They may never know the answer to that question. I want to bring in Rahima Ellis for more on this. And again, it's that piece that is, I think, just so, it is horrific in any instance. Um, and it is here, too. Why? Appears to be random, police say. Yeah, um, as police were saying, it's, it's basically a random act of terror. They talked about uh, who was killed. I should mention to you that three of these, two of the women were in their 70s. The third was in her late 90s. And Gwendolyn and Melody were mother-daughter. So that family is shattered tonight, as are so many others, because there were, in the shooting spree, six houses that they know of so far were hit, and three people in, uh, people in three cars. All of our victims were in their automobiles and didn't have a chance, according to what we're hearing from police. This was such a horrifying incident for people, some in their homes, while no one in their home was injured. We got word from one woman who was in her home with her daughter, and the shots were coming through the walls of her home. It was a horrifying incident. Police talked about it in the news conference just a short while ago. Take a listen. When you encounter something of such, you know, magnitude that, I mean, it shocks your senses. The, the amount of violence and brutality that these innocent people faced is something that is unconscionable to me. And they're talking about an 18-year-old high school student that got these weapons. He had a minimum of three uh, firearms, and they say an a AR-15 style, an AR-style weapon. Uh, one he purchased right after his he turned 18 back in November, and he got several other weapons from family members. They don't know if the family members were aware of what he had or not. In addition to that, they say that this 18-year-old, they believe in their conversations with people, had some issues issues in connection with mental illness, but he may not have been diagnosed specifically with a particular kind of mental illness, but they're looking into that as well. Hallie? 
Rahima Ellis, thank you very much for that reporting. Back here in Washington now, the head of OpenAI, the company that makes Chat GPT, you know that chatbot everybody's playing with right now, basically begging members of Congress today to regulate his own company, to regulate companies like his before the tech gets ahead of itself. Sam Altman laying out this plan for how he wants the government to do it, like create a new agency to license AI models, put in place some safety standards, and make sure that the models are independently audited. The whole point is to keep AI in check. It's fascinating coming from him, considering that, you know, his profession is building out AI. And you've got members of Congress trying to understand this technology, trying to get ahead of any potential risks here. Risks highlighted particularly interestingly by the way that Senator Richard Blumenthal kicked off this hearing, opening it up. I want you to listen, and I say listen very specifically. Listen carefully. The lack of transparency can undermine public trust. If you were listening from home, you might have thought that voice was mine and the words from me. But in fact, that voice was not mine. Tom Costello is joining us now, covering all of this for us today. Um, Richard Blumenthal there, right? Yeah. Showing like, hey, he made that with ChatGPT in a, in a deep fake voice. It right. sounds just like him. And that's part of the risk and the concern that lawmakers and, you know, tech officials have. Election interference came up, for yeah. example. Like, what happens? This is sort of uncharted territory. Well, think you. about what AI is. It literally is pulling from the databases Scraping of Scraping everything online. All of human history, right. all of the knowledge we have accumulated over thousands of years, and then that also accumulates all of our voices, and his voice in particular. And it created a fake him. And if it sounded that real, using words that he would think, you know, he sure. might use himself, that is a threat. That's a threat not only to the the believability of a public figure, to the democracy, to government, to essentially everything that we know and trust every day that we can build our lives off of. So how do you know if it's real and what are the stakes? Here's what the CEO said, Sam Altman, when he was calling for regulation, please. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world significant harm to the world. You may recall last week I interviewed Professor Jeffrey Hinton, the University of Toronto, the so-called godfather of AI who helped invent it. He walked away from Google because he wanted to issue the warning. And the warning to him, uh, from him to me was humans may be replaced by superior in, uh, capability, brain power, within five years. Five years. I don't even like, I mean, how do you wrap your head around something like it's that? It's impossible. So the question is, how do you keep that from getting out of control from becoming how from 2001 a space odyssey or irobot well i thought it was interesting that josh hawley described it as like could this be like because a tool is a tool right it's a yep. double edged could this be the new printing press or could this be the new atomic bomb that's exactly Super it stark. it is transformative technology it will certainly change our lives our world our kids lives for the for the good or not so good and uh, oh by the way almost everybody is promising that we will lose jobs to computers, wow. to AI, and it will start, it's already happening, it will accelerate in the coming weeks and months. What are the chances, like, if you were to handicap it, and I know you're not a, neither a betting man nor, like, a fortune yeah. teller, but, like, you know, that the government regulation could actually happen. It's some of the things that Sam Altman wants to see, you know, a, a gov new government agency, independent audits of this tech yeah. could actually be reality. Uh, so as I tell you that, why don't you throw up the graphic on how quickly this is exploding on chat GPT. Monthly visits are amazing. So listen, the European Union just passed uh, a, a law. They're in the process of passing sweeping laws governing AI. And in addition to that, the UK is about to do the same. We are way, 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 way behind. This hearing was interesting because you've got Republicans and Democrats who are pretty much agreeing yeah. that we got to do something to regulate this before it's too late. Think of how we regulate nuclear power, something like that. It's even incredible to hear those two things, yeah. nuclear power and artificial intelligence, in the same sentence like that. Tom Costello, thank you. Appreciate you bet. it. To North Carolina now, where in just the last hour, Republicans in the state Senate have voted to override a veto by the Democratic governor there, basically meaning that a bill to restrict abortion access for women there is a step closer to becoming law. The drama has shifted to the House, and all week, you've had the governor, Roy Cooper, again, a Democrat, lobbying to get just one vote, just one vote to stop this bill. That's all he would need to make sure that this veto fails. The woman you see here could be key, Trisha 
Cotham. She's a Republican in the State House who switched parties, even though she won her seat only a few months ago as a Democrat who backs abortions rights. Now, if the House in North Carolina overturns the veto, abortion would be limited in most cases after 12 weeks. There are some exceptions, 20 weeks in cases of rape or incest, 24 for, quote, life-limiting fetal anomalies. The only case where there's no limit is if there's any threat to the mother's life. Yamiche Alcindor is following this for us. Uh, Yamiche, um, there have been protests in North Carolina there. The polls that we're seeing show that most people in that state, the majority, do not back overriding the governor. But the governor doesn't have the one vote that he needs to stop the state house from overruling him. I mean, nothing has changed in that dynamic, and we're going to know for sure later tonight, right? That's right. Both North Carolina chambers are expected to override the veto of that Democratic governor, Roy Cooper, who can't get that one vote that you've been talking about. The state Senate, just as you said, voted to override his veto. They did it on exactly the number of votes they needed. The House is set to vote next with exactly the number of votes they need to do that. But the GOP's push to further restrict abortion access, it's not in line with public opinion in the state, according to polling that we've been studying. Let's put up some numbers for folks from a Meredith College poll. 31 percent of North Carolina Carolina voters want the state to keep its current 20-week abortion ban. 26% of voters want abortion access to be even further expanded. And a much smaller number of voters want further restrictions, including just 9% of North Carolina voters who want access to be under 15 weeks of pregnancy, which is what this new bill would do. And we should put up another graphic for votes to tell people about all of the things that this bill would do, which is including mandating that doctors would be present for medication abortions and coming up with a $5,000 fine for mailing a abortion pills, Hallie. Big picture, Yamish. Um, I know you want to talk about this map that shows sort of where states in the South are when it relates to um, abortion bans and restrictions there, because this explains to me why this matters is more than just a state level story. It's a it's a regional and national story because it's going to affect millions of women potentially beyond the borders of North Carolina. Hallie, it's such an important map that you put up. These new restrictions in North Carolina would have sweeping effects for women across the South and in that region. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last June, North Carolina and, by the way, South Carolina have both become top abortion destinations for people from states where it's banned or severely restricted. And it's clear in the numbers. North Carolina has had a 37 percent jump in abortions being performed in the last year. And in 2022, South Carolina there uh, were about 1,000 more abortions performed and nearly half of those patients were from out of state and already some providers are under strain with women sometimes having to wait a month for an appointment and drive up to four hours in some cases from places like Tennessee. So those drive times, they're just going to get longer and longer and it's just going to get harder to get abortion access in that in the region and in the South. Hallie. Yamish Alcindor, thank you very much. We'll be keeping an eye on how this vote plays out. Relief tonight for a Chicago father whose daughter has been found after six years. Kayla Mbihan was just nine years old when she was allegedly kidnapped by her mother, who did not have legal custody of her. Her father reported her missing, and police have been looking for her ever since. She's 15 now, and just this week, she was found in North Carolina when somebody in a store recognized her mom from a media report and called police, according to law enforcement. This is a case that got national attention last year, and it was featured on this Netflix show you may have heard of, Unsolved Mysteries. Maggie Vespa is joining us now, and it's, it's, it is um, an incredible moment here, and I say that sort of in, the, in all definitions of the term, because this was basically sure. a cold case, got a lot of publicity from that Netflix show elsewhere, and then somebody ended up recognizing Kayla's mom. We don't know specifically from which media report, but from something. Right, exactly. They say it's that published media um, credit that police are kind of, you know, pinning this on and saying that basically somebody saw Kayla's mom in a, in a Plato's closet, one of those kind of clothing resale stores in Asheville, North Carolina. We don't know what the connection is to Asheville, North Carolina, but we know that she had family kind of in the southeast. So generally that region makes sense, but recognized her from, again, quote unquote, published media, according to police. It sounds like it might be one of these true crime shows and said, I think that's the mom who's accused of kidnapping the daughter, called police, police show up, and they arrest the mom in this case. Uh, you see her there. And so, again, now we have a situation where this girl, after six years, she's now 15 years old, is home with her dad. He's just as shocked as anyone, according to his statement. He released a statement through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, saying, quote, I'm overjoyed that Kayla is home safe. We ask for privacy, he added, as we, and we thought this was really poignant, get to know each other again and navigate this new beginning. 
And so once again, this girl has just been through unimaginable trauma. And now this family is putting together the pieces. The mother in this case are now also facing charges related to this. One count of child uh, abduction, quarter million dollars bond, more charges possible in this case as well. We're told she's being extradited back to Illinois, but Kayla mm -hmm. is already home, Hallie, back with her dad, back with his family. But just a crazy connection that, that it sounds like um, brought this family back together after so long. And a long journey ahead for her. I mean, I just think about that, Maggie, and you touched on that. Just, I mean, 9 to 15 and just the way that you, your life changes. And it's just, it's um, sort of unimaginable to think about what she's going through now. Oh, absolutely. And we do want to point out, too, you know, it's interesting kind of in this modern era, like, you know, we know, everybody knows America kind of has this sort of true crime obsession at this point. But advocates we spoke to uh, with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, to call it a true crime obsession, they say almost kind of sounds unseemly. They see it as a true ally and a true asset in their fight to bring these kids home, even potentially years later. And it's interesting. We just saw this tweet. We want to show you this from Netflix. It's getting a little bit of attention, so we want to talk about it. Netflix basically saying that they have closed a case. Unsolved Mysteries has closed a case. Of course, it's the, you know, the kind of the resurgence of the classic 90s show that we all used to watch when we were home from school in the summer. And says a store owner in North Carolina recognized Kayla Unbihan, um, uh, who was there with her mother, and kind of, again, crediting them, crediting that show. We do want to point out Netflix right now is the only one saying that Netflix specifically is the published media or ah, that Unsolved Mysteries is the published right. media. And police right now are just kind of keeping that vague. She was featured on a number of shows, but advocates say it's definitely a really valuable resource that in this case seemingly yeah. made all the difference. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thank you very much. The CDC putting out a new warning tonight that the MPOX outbreak is not over as it's looking into a new cluster of cases in Chicago, raising some concerns ahead of the summer. Between April 17th and May 5th, Chicago reported 13 cases. You see it here. All of them were men who had symptoms. Nine of the 13 were fully vaccinated. So the CDC is like, hey, looking at the end of the spring, looking ahead to the summer, there could be a resurgence of MPOX as people gather for festivals and for other things. Remember, this spreads by person-to-person -person contact. It mainly affects gay and bisexual men. For a while, it seemed like the spread of MPOX was slowing down. Literally just last week, the World Health Organization declared this no longer a global health emergency. And here in the U.S., the public health emergency over MPOX ended at the end of January. Dr. Natalie Azar joins me now. Um, Dr. Natalie, let me pull up this sort of cluster of cases in Chicago, a graph of this over the last few weeks, right? Sure, but look at the peak last summer. Way, way, way more, right? Context is key here. So help us understand the level of concern for public health experts, given where we are now. Yeah, well, I think it's it's an, it's interesting, right, that less than a week since the World Health Organization said it no longer designated MPOX as a global health threat, that it could still remain a public health challenge. And I think what's important to understand here, again, as you said, context, of course, is that only one out of four high-risk individuals act, actually has been vaccinated. And, and and we don't know how long protection lasts. This this The use of this small smallpox vaccine for MPOX was actually a novel intervention. Um, you know, I think it's important for people to understand, again, that the vast majority of people who are going to get infected with MPOX are going to be just fine, but there are going to be vulnerable individuals who can get sicker. I think there's a few things to take from this, from this new cluster. As you mentioned, nine of the individuals were fully yeah. vaccinated. As I mentioned, we don't know how long protection lasts. None of the individuals was hospitalized. We don't know their underlying health history, but that's obviously encouraging because experts do believe that the um, that the vaccine, even if it doesn't protect you against infection, will prevent you from severe disease, much like covid vaccines. Dr. Natalie Azar, um, that is it is interesting to watch. We'll keep an eye on it. Thank you very much for the breakdown. Appreciate it. Coming up, a popular Jeep is getting recalled. We've just found out why safety experts warn hundreds of thousands of Cherokee owners do not park your car outside. Plus, Taco Bell ringing the bell of a much smaller rival. The move it made today to try to liberate the phrase Taco Tuesday. It's a food fight in our five things.
tonight, rare public comment from author Salman Rushdie, who, remember, was attacked and badly hurt on stage nine months ago, now sounding an alarm about what he calls remarkably alarming censorship threats to publishing and to libraries and to kids' books in this country. Listen. We live in a moment, I think, uh, at which freedom of expression, freedom to publish has not in my lifetime been under such threat in the, in the countries of the West. So you saw Rushdie making those comments on a, like a video Zoom kind of thing when he was being honored by the British Book Awards. He was blinded in his right eye, had nerve damage to his hand when he was attacked at a literary festival in New York in August of last year. Ron Allen is joining us now. You have um, Salman Rushdie, who's been like, physically attacked for his own writing, talking about the freedom to publish at a time when there has been a broader discussion in this country about what should and shouldn't be published and taught, right? Exactly. He says that, you know, this has always been the case in places like Russia and China, the, the communist world. Uh, but he notes that here in the United States, there are a lot of discussions, a lot of fights, if you will, about what books can be in libraries and schools. A lot of it has to do with history. A lot of it has to do with race. A lot of it has to do with gender identity. There's an organization called PEN America, PEN America, that says that there are now more books being banned more in more school districts, in more states, uh, as many as 35 states and that this is an, an alarming thing, and it continues. And here's what Rusty had to say about that issue generally. Take a listen. And the freedom to publish books that ought to be published, um, that need to be published, and sometimes uh, are difficult to publish because of pressure from this or that group. Um, it's very important, I think, that such pressure should be resisted. There's another thing that Penn America said is that it's not just parents who are trying to have books banned. There are now more advocacy groups involved in this, and many of those groups are connected to state lawmakers in different places who are trying to get bans in bans in an organized way. Um, so that's different. And this is, yes, something that's uh, being fought all over the country, particularly in certain states. Allie? There, there, I also wonder what Rushdie's thoughts are on this issue, and we've covered it a lot on this show, like the idea, and it comes up every few months, editing books by somebody, we've talked about it, Agatha Christie, Roald Dahl, right, to remove language that is now seen as offensive at the time was, you know, the, the argument goes, critics would say, like, at the time it was put very different now, right? He talked about this, too. He does, and he, here's what he basically says. He says that books have to come to us from their time and be of their time. And a lot of people would disagree with that notion because they want books to be relevant to the times that we live in. There's a whole industry of people called sensitivity readers these days in, in the publishing world. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're rereading books and making huge edits in, in books. Um, Ian Fleming, for example, wrote the Bond, James Bond series. But think about the fact that he was born in 1908 and died in 1964, and the books were written in the 1950s. So a lot has changed since then. And so there are references, for example, to Africa African criminals who are drunken all the time, and that's been removed. There's reference to a couple in Harlem having a conversation, and he describes their accent as straight Harlem, deep south, with lots of New York thrown in, which some people find, well, people's uh, Harlem is a little bit more complicated than, than that. Um, in Dahl's books, these children's books, there are even references to mother and father that have been changed to parents and family because of sensitivities. So. Again, this is going to vary book by book, uh, region of the country by region of the country. Some of it may go too far for some people. Some people like to read books in their time, of their time, with a language of their time, and the stereotypes, and all, so on and so forth. Some don't. And I guess, as I said, this is something that's being fought, debated all yeah. across the country. Yeah, for sure, writ large. Ron Allen, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a new report says the number of known global executions in 2022 was the most it's been in five years. Amnesty International found that state executions rose more than 50 percent from 2021 to 2022, and more than 880 people were put to death, most of those executions reportedly happening in Iran and Saudi Arabia. Number two, the DOJ says it's charging a former Apple engineer for allegedly stealing the company's self-driving tech for a Chinese company. 
According to the indictment, this guy worked at Apple for two years, where he was given what they call broad access to databases. He's the third Apple worker to be accused of stealing trade secrets for China. Apple declining to comment. Number three, shares of Vodafone took a hit today after the British telecom company announced plans to lay off 11,000 workers, reportedly the biggest round of layoffs that company's ever had. The CEO says the cuts would focus on cutting out complexity to try to get more competitive. Number four, the parent company of Jeep is recalling more than 220,000 Jeep Grand Cherokees. They're like a really popular car. You probably recognize it. Model years 2014 to 2016 is what we're talking about. The company, Stellantis, is telling owners to park them outside and away from other cars because those power lift gates can catch fire even when the engine is off. The company says it hasn't figured out a fix yet, so watch this space. Number five, new fight now between Taco Bell and smaller rival Taco John's over the trademark for Taco Tuesday. Taco John's has owned that trademark for decades. Well, now Taco Bell says the phrase should be up for grabs for anybody who sells tacos. Writing in a new petition to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, they want to quote, I'm quoting here, they want to liberate the phrase for restaurants nationwide. Taco John's CEO responding by saying, I'd like to thank our worthy competitors at Taco Bell for reminding everyone that Taco Tuesday is best celebrated at Taco John's. We're, we're celebrating Taco Tuesday tonight in my household. I want, I want to let you know. Okay, Santa Rosa, that's it. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we are hearing exclusively from Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella about his concerns over where AI is heading. What scares you about this? What, I'll call it, societal choices do we make given this new technology? We definitely want the benefits of this technology and we want to mitigate the unintended consequences. That conversation coming from a sit-down interview at the company's campus just outside Seattle with CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin in a special airing tonight right here on NBC News Now. Remember, Microsoft made some massive investments, multi-billion dollar investments into open AI, tons of money. OpenAI, of course, is the company that created ChatGPT and is now becoming one of the fastest growing apps in history. Nadella tells Andrew that AI is moving fast, and he thinks that's a good thing. Yes, it's moving fast, but moving fast in the right direction. Uh, moving fast where humans are more in control. We are lucky to have Andrew joining us now. Andrew, thank you very much for being here. Thank you know you this segment, me. right? The behind I the scenes well. look. And I'm like, very excited. Okay. Well, our viewers know you, and they know that you talk to, like, big-name people in the business world all the time, right? But this is, like, especially with how fast AI moves, especially with how big, like, high-profile this is, did you approach this interview differently than you've approached other interviews? Tell us about your process. Well, I think what we're trying to do... I mean, first of all, we're trying to get Satya Nadella, who really, I mean, has transformed Microsoft as a result of yes. his partnership with ChatGPT. I mean, they, they went for, I mean, the other piece of this was, you know, Google, we all search on Google. All of a sudden, Bing, people are talking about Bing in a way they never did before. So I, I was desperate to talk to him. But then in terms of the, the conversation itself, I wanted this conversation not to be a business conversation. I wanted this almost ah. to be a philosophical conversation about the pros and the cons and to try to get as honest a, a perspective as I could about it to talk about. We talked about education and what it's going to do to our kids. And we talked about plagiarism and what that means and the value of content, the media industry that we're in. And I think we really got behind a lot of the issues that sort of are, are festering underneath what is going to be a transformative thing, uh, both in fabulous ways and probably some less fabulous ways, too. I'm super interested to hear you say this, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about was whether or not you sort of framed this thinking about like the quote unquote CNBC viewer, right, which maybe right. is a different no. kind and type of viewer. It sounds like you did not. It sounds no, like no, you no. specifically there, wanted this. to There be were broader. lots of questions I had that I knew that that business viewers of CNBC would want asked. And, and we asked uh, some of those. Uh, by the way, we ran some of that on CNBC. But for this special, what we really wanted to do was sort of uh, capture really the way I think the, the public, the broad public, maybe not interested in business at all, but recognizes that their kids are using it. I've got three kids. We're, you yeah. know, they're playing with this thing. We're all trying to figure out what does it mean? Do we, are we going to keep our jobs? What's going to happen to us? I mean, that was really, I think, what this was about. And I think we got underneath a lot of it. Did anything surprise you? You know a lot about this topic. You know a lot about it. Was there anything that he said that you were like, huh, that is actually shocking to me? You know, I think 
Well, first of all, he's a very he's and maybe this is true of all people in tech. He's very optimistic about the technology. And that's that's yeah. clear. You know, I would say is it maybe not something that he said or maybe he referenced, in fact, Bill Gates, who had said that he saw two demos in his whole life that he thought were transformative. One was back in the 80s. He saw um, graphical interfaces. I mean, what effectively became the Mac interface and the Windows interface. And he said it wasn't till last fall when a bunch of folks showed up with ChatGPT in his home to give him a demo. And he said this was such a profound thing. And wow. I also got a chance to see some of what they're working on at Microsoft. And it's profound. I mean, profound in a sort of scary way, but also in a super exciting way. So um, there's a little bit for everybody. Well, but that's the thing, too, with stuff like this. It can, it can sometimes be a double-edged sword. So we are excited to see the special. We are thrilled to have you on, giving us that peek behind the curtain. Um, thank, thank you, you. so, thank you so much me. for doing this. Andrew, really appreciate it. Appreciate it. And you got to watch, folks. It's tonight uh, right here on NBC News Now. However you're watching, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time with Andrew Ross Sorkin. Do not miss it. Still to come, a German court sentencing a group of men for their $100 million jewelry heist. What happened to the stuff they stole? Coming up in the local. So polls are closing tonight in some local races that go beyond just the boundaries of where they're being held, right? They could have a big impact or at least tell us something, right? Be a bit of a canary in the coal mine as it relates to the big deal election next year in 2024. Today in Florida, there's a close mayoral runoff in Jacksonville that could give us a sense of how strong Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' endorsement actually is before he announces a run for his own campaign for the White House, probably in a matter of days here. And can Democrats win a key race in a state that's been leaning more Republican? There's also Kentucky, where it's a battle of dueling endorsements as Republicans are voting on who they want to take on Democratic Governor Andy Bashir this fall. Former President Trump is endorsing one leading candidate, Florida Governor, of course, DeSantis, endorsing the other. Dasha Burns is live for us there in Frankfort, Kentucky. So help us understand kind of the, the proxy fight vibes here, right? Because that's what this seems to be in a very, we don't often talk about primaries like that. This is national news for a reason. Yeah, Hallie, there are a couple of layers here, actually, because this is sort of a bellwether for what message will win out for Republican voters, both right now and potentially, as you said, in 2024. Because you've got Daniel Cameron, who's the Kentucky attorney general, who has the endorsement of former President Trump. But in Kelly Craft, you have the endorsement of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. But you also have in that candidate, Allie, the more Trumpian style of politics. She's been the one that's been really leaning into the culture war. She's been out on the campaign trail talking about wokeism. And uh, Daniel Cameron has really been more the kitchen table guy. He's also been a longtime ally of Mitch McConnell, which when we followed him on the campaign trail, he tries to stay away from as much as possible. That's not something that has proven to be very popular with voters right now, which is fascinating. And in, in, in years past, that would not have been someone you would try to distance yourself from in Kentucky, right? A powerful, longtime Republican uh, here in this state. So it's really just this indicator of where Republican politics have, have come to. And I want you to hear just a little bit of what we heard from voters today. Take a listen. I voted for Kelly because her views are closely reflected my, my views as a conservative. He's young. He's, uh, I like his morals. He's got that, he's got that swag to him and I, I really like him. And and of course, whoever wins the Republican nomination tonight is going to have kind of an uphill battle. Uh, Democratic Governor Andy Bashir is actually quite popular in the state of Kentucky, which might be surprising considering the national politics. Uh, but Republicans are going to have a challenge in beating him, Hallie. I'm going to ask you to flip your sort of Kentucky hat here for your like uh, Florida campaign hat because you've been covering Ron DeSantis, <laughs> right? Like what is going on? Because you were part of the team that scooped that he is likely to be announcing his run for the presidency in a matter of days here. Do we know which day or is that still TBD? 
Still TBD on which day, but there has been a consistent drip drip from Team DeSantis of trying to lay the groundwork of building the momentum. Over the weekend, he made three city stops in Iowa. He came into that trip with 37 endorsements from Iowa state legislators. And we also scooped today with my colleague John Allen that his team rolled out uh, 50 New Hampshire endorsements, which kind of entered him into the endorsement war zone, Hallie, which also really only happens with candidates, which makes me think that this is is coming soon, an announcement uh, as part of that uh, that endorsement rollout. We had a, a few endorsements that the Never Back Down team, his super PAC, told us flipped from Trump to DeSantis. Some of those now told us one of one of the uh, endorsers told us she's endorsing both, which is kind of an unusual place to be. Uh, another said she's actually now sticking with Trump, although she signed a pledge for DeSantis. So complicated place for lawmakers to be when they don't really want to tick off either of the guys that could potentially be the Republican nominee. Hallie. Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, the CIA out with a new recruitment video, this time trying to attract Russians. We'll explain why. Plus, a Nigerian chef now adding world record holder to her resume. What she did to get that title later on. Today, the CIA posting a new video online that actually encourages Russians to share secrets with the U.S. Watch. Это всегда будет моя Россия. Я выстою. Моя семья выстоит. Мы будем жить достойно. You can see, obviously, the video is in Russian. It was first posted to Telegram. Since then, it's been on sites like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. With the CIA officials saying, we want to reach those brave Russians who feel compelled by the Russian government's unjust war to engage CIA and ensure they do so as securely as possible. NBC News Chief National Security Correspondent Dan DeLuce has more. The CIA has launched a video on social media offering Russians a secure way to share secrets about Russia with America's spy agency. It's a slickly produced video that resembles a Hollywood trailer. The video shows a fictional character, a Russian government official, as he appears to reflect on the state of his country and the future of his family. A Russian-speaking narrator says at one point, is it the kind of life I dreamt of? At the end of the video, the Russian characters contact the CIA on their mobile phones. People around you may not want to hear the truth, the narrator says in the video, but we do. You are not powerless. A CIA official tells NBC News the video is meant to show fictional Russian officials making the difficult but important decision to secretly contact CIA using a secure portal. The video appeal is the latest sign that Western intelligence agencies believe that Russia's troubled war effort presents a golden opportunity to recruit disaffected Russians. And it's not the first time. Last year, the CIA posted instructions online on how Russians can safely contact the agency. Hallie? Our thanks to Dan DeLuce for that. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a new segment we call The Global. A German court today convicted five men for stealing $100 million worth of jewels from a museum back in 2019. They were all sentenced to up to six years, some of them less. All in all, they stole 21 pieces of jewelry containing something like 4,000 diamonds. Most of those jewels got returned. In Nigeria, a, ch a chef just spent 100 hours, 100 hours cooking meals nonstop trying to set a Guinness World Record for the longest ever cooking session by one person. She's 27. The marathon started Thursday, ended just overnight, basically. The Nigerian president, along with several celebrities, were there to cheer her on as she prepared a mix of local and foreign dishes. And in Italy, archaeologists just found two more skeletons in the ruins of Pompeii, that ancient Roman city wiped out by Mount Vesuvius 2,000 years ago. Scientists say the human remains are probably from two men in their 50s who died in an earthquake triggered by the eruption, killing them in a building collapse, not volcanic ash like most of Pompeii's victims. When we come back, a celebrity couple and a new revelation creating a huge debate online about who does pay the bills in a relationship. We got more in tonight's original.
So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it is all about money, your money, maybe your partner's money. How do you share it? How do you split it? This whole conversation sparked by some new comments from actor Gabrielle Union. Her husband, former NBA player Dwayne Wade, and she have a household together. They pay their bills apparently 50-50, according to a new interview she's doing with Bloomberg. And that's what has so many people online talking about how they split their own bills, how they deal with it in their own families. One expert our team talked with says it's not surprising considering how touchy of a subject money can be for people, especially people in relationships. New money talk from actor Gabrielle Union, revealing she and her husband, former NBA player Dwayne Wade, split their money right down the middle. It's weird to say I'm head of household because in this household, we split everything 50-50. But in the other households that each of us have to support, it puts this, there's always this like, gorilla on your back that it is like you better work you better work you better work union opening up in an interview on a bloomberg original series called idea generation i get nervous like oh god that that movie didn't open you know well what does that mean do i am i do i do am i gonna have enough to to, to hold everybody up and 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 everyone's like it's coming like Calm down. All of it clearly hitting a nerve online. Union's comments going viral as a lot of people talk about how they handle their money and how couples handle cash. Now, how are you living paycheck to paycheck when your husband got money? 50 50. Ooh, 50 50. The back and forth over how to split the bills, nothing new for most couples. For some reason, people just don't want to talk about their money, couples especially. And having that money talk with your partner is one of the most important things that you can do in your financial life and for financial security for both of you. These days, about 29% of marriages are something described as egalitarian, according to a new study, which basically means that both partners contribute about half of what they make. To put that number in perspective, back in 1972... It was just 11%. The generation most likely to have separate accounts? Millennials. 69% of them report having at least some cash in separate places. There may be couples that decide to split 50-50, but there are also couples that may say, hey, we're going to look at our household income, how much we each contributed to that number as it's combined, and then we're going to split our finances based on that. Money can be one of the biggest flashpoints in a relationship, with 64% of couples saying they're financially incompatible with their partners. That's not the case for Alexandra Hayes Robinson and her husband. I think we're very lucky that money has never been a touchy subject for us. So how do they do it? She says they decided long ago to split the bills based on how much money each of them made, the one who makes more pays more, and today they're happier for it. We haven't officially merged our finances in the way that like we have one bank account and everything we both make go into one account, but we've merged our finances in like the like spiritual sense, I guess. We think about everything we have as one pot. There will be a lot of opportunity for us to have lots of kind of financial tension in our relationship, and there just isn't. Experts say one of the hardest parts about getting on the same financial page with your partner can be figuring out how to start the conversation and keep it going. They say a financial advisor could be a good resource for that. That is it for us for this hour and for the one before it. If you missed any of it, catch up on the latest reporting and newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places, including Peacock, Hulu, YouTube, and more. Just search for Hallie Jackson now. Top Story picks up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.